Hey, it's Joyce Conroy. You are on the block party and Ernie's corner. And you know, Ernie always has fun with us, but it's even more special because we have a guest, rock and roll hall of famer, Grammy winner, and original bassist for the Alice Cooper band, Dennis Dunaway. Dennis, thank you so much for being a part of the block party. Oh, yeah. This is going to be fun. Yeah, uh, it's great. Great having you here, Dennis. Awesome. And thank you so much for taking time to do this with Joyce and I. We've talked about Alice Cooper albums in the past, but this one, this one holds a real significance for me, and I'm sure for you guys, too. You guys were on your way uh, to, after Killer, this album was going to be destined for greatness. And um, for me, I was leaving Craig Braun <laughs> and, for, you know, and had to walk away from the credits for this album. But it didn't matter because I knew that I needed to do greater things, too. And I was so, you know, restricted where I was along with Tony. And then, you know, all of a sudden you guys came along, man, and it was just a mind blower, a mind blower. So tell us a little bit about your, you know, your perspective on this album. Well, uh, it it was easy for us to do. I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, I look at songwriting like there's this big uh, circle of ideas uh, floating around up there in the creative cosmos. And you have to keep your antenna tuned in and grab these ideas when when you recognize them. And then you have to make them tangible. Yeah. Well, it doesn't always work as easily some songs you really have to know your craft and it's like pulling teeth you know but schools out the song fell in our laps like a gift from the gods and i think a lot of that had to do with the fact that we all went to high school in Together. phoenix arizona the same year and and you could uh alice and glenn and i went to one high school and you could practically throw a rock and hit the high schools that neil and michael bruce went to yeah. so so uh when and you guys were on teams together too right track and stuff uh, like that. alice alice yeah, art, school, art classes yeah. yeah alice and i ran long distance the only time glenn would run is is if he was running from the law yeah <laughs> gb i miss gb i know you guys do too you were yeah. you were like a family you know, like, yeah you know, it was yeah, great it was best yeah. Uh, and this album, we look at like uh, the band looks at it like it was Glenn's album because his attitude and everything permeates the whole. Deal, sure. You know? Yeah. And he also had a blast recording it. You know, we were in New York City and therefore the concept of high school uh, got uh, uh, changed a bit to West Side Story because we all love that. Sure. So right. Now we're in New York City. So now we're imagining, oh, we're kids that are out of school and now we're in a street gang in New York City. So yeah. we would do things on this album that didn't make the final cut. Like it's like three o'clock in the morning in New York City and we run a microphone cord all the way out to the street. <laughs> and every time a ca every time a cab driver came by, we would yell at him. And he would yell back and we would record what he said. And we thought we would <laughs> and we thought we would get that on the album. Unfortunately, uh it was nothing but explicatives that we couldn't use on the album. So <laughs> but we had fun. Yeah, I know. And you and you did a sort of a, a cut that really sort of immortalized the West Side story. And when I first saw you guys at the Palladium uh in 1971, uh, when Can Heat opened for you guys. And that the uh, the Jets thing and and the Alley Cats and the the heckler that came up out of the stage and or onto the stage and Alice stabs him and the lights go out people are going crazy I mean you know everything about the persona of your image and your album was really reflected for me in that night when I saw you guys because I had only heard you and I had only seen pictures in Billboard and I had only seen pictures on past albums and when we, bad reviews in Rolling Stone. Yeah, I don't pay any attention to reviews. You know, they're so jaded, and we talked about that before. It's it's so misleading. So much great music has been panned, and now 30, 40 years later, it's getting rediscovered. That's a beautiful thing about music. You'll live forever, and your music will live forever, and people will constantly rediscover it, which is exciting. And Because when they do, guess what? They, dis they, they discover the value that I brought 
to what you guys did. See, Alice and I became friends in art class. Yes. Uh, uh, and we love Salvador Dali, and we wanted to incorporate those kind of ideas. And also the the pop artists from New York City, we knew about, you know, uh, happenings and and sure. uh, and we tried to incorporate, we said, okay, let's start a band and let's incorporate those ideas. But in, and I had, I was always known as the artist in, in grade school, a lot of kids didn't even know my name. They called me the artist. <laughs> and so when it came time to uh, decide between moving to art. New York City and pursuing art or going to L.A. with the band, I had a big decision to make. But I decided, OK, well, we're going to incorporate art into the the band. And yeah. also, uh, I believe that they're all interchangeable. And that's what's so great about the album cover that you guys created, because a School's Out album, uh, if it had a different cover that wasn't so amazing, uh, it would have a whole different uh, persona. Yeah. This uh, The artwork was perfect for what we were trying to do musically. And that's really great to hear from me, because... I had to walk away. I had to make a decision too, just like you. I was working for Craig Braun. I was doing this album, Cheech and Chong's Big Bamboo at the same time and had done the Stone Sung and Jesus Christ Superstar before that. I had to walk away from that credit, the credit for this album. The Grammy, the album cover was nominated for a Grammy, Joyce, which was really pretty incredible. And, that is awesome. Yeah, and but then the next year, we didn't get it, but the next year we were nominated for another Alice Cooper album, Billion Dollar Baby. So, you know, I mean, it was, uh, you know, for me, it was a hard thing to do because I to start Pacific Ioneer um, and walk away from that credit completely still to this day. Uh, but thank God for, you know, people like you, Joyce, and others and Dennis willing to come on and talk with us about it, that this record's being set straight, you know, and Shep, Shep Gordon played an important part of that because I had created a comp for this album because I there was no you know, internet, there was no, uh, you know, uh, social media. You listened to what the disc jockey said, you, you, you know, you read billboard at cash box and record world. And that's where I discovered that the Alice Cooper group, which I was blown away with, uh, was in the studio doing a new album called schools out. So I created that comp and brought it out to LA with me in hopes of getting together with, you know, somebody. And that's how it ended up happening. Tony had reached out to Shep and, it was pretty incredible. This is neat, Dennis and Ernie, because you know what? What I have in my hand is the Schools at album, and this was played on Baltimore radio. I have been very fortunate to have inherited a lot of my husband's collection because he worked for one of the uh, Prague rock stations. And uh, I've got uh, this love it to death and killer. So, you know, this was what Baltimore radio, they loved it. And to, to, you know, be able to inherit this and to speak to you and Ernie is it, it's mind blowing. And just thank you for the great work that you've done. I, I know it's not easy when it comes to music. It is uh, it is a real true commitment. It is. And, well, and, and we're artists, uh, er, Ernie. Uh, we're artists and artists te uh, tend to think about ideas and then you try to make them tangible, but not that many artists are good at uh, actually making things happen. Yeah, just like musicians, they're, you know, again, you've got to be special and you're even better than special. The Alice Cooper group was amazing. There was nothing like it. And so many imitators, you know, so many imitators after you and tried to, you know, hang on to your coattails. But you were blazing trails, you know, that nobody else was doing and could follow. It was an incredible uh, run, you know, for you guys is still to this day. You know, so, well, so. we came along at a time when there was the bar was set high because of the British invasion, the Beatles, yeah. their album covers changed the landscape and set the bar high. And and then you had uh, other companies, record companies that weren't as uh, good about doing what artistic things that the band wanted to do as Warner Brothers. So that that was a factor as well. They sure. went along with our ideas, you know, rather yeah. than just, a lot of bands didn't know what their album cover would look like until it came out. 
And yeah, then and then they were whether that. they were happy with it or not didn't matter. It was already out. That's how record companies looked at product. You had so much product to move every month. You know, and, and I think that I, I went to Warner Brothers to meet with Ed Thrasher along with Chef, with Ed Thrasher, the creative director at Warner Brothers. And um, they were really, really excited about having Alice Cooper Group on their label. And Chef pretty much got whatever he wanted. And it was what you guys wanted and what we all wanted. And he, you know, he didn't have to fight for it. You know, again, they realized the greatness of your of you guys and what you were doing for that label. And you were on the cutting edge of where music was going. And it was just phenomenal. And I'll, I'll you know, always remember those experiences with Shep. You know, Shep was a, a huge ally for you guys and a real champion. And, you know, I always could refer to him as like John Madden was a football player's coach. Shep Gordon was a musician and the band's coach. He was 100% for you guys and, and, and you know, and, and understood what needed to be done. Nobody was doing what you guys are doing. And that's, I think a lot of that has to go to Chef Gordon and, and knowing how to take your art and making it so relevant to the masses. Well, and especially because when, uh, when Shep and Joe met the band, Cindy's the one that found them for us. And she brought them up to the Tabanga Canyon house and we were playing songs from Pretties For You. And that was as far from commercial as you could get. And, 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 and the first time they came to see us, it was the GTO's uh, stage front, all uh, screaming for us and stuff. And, and then Frank Zappa was in the back of the room. And Joe and Shep were there to see us for the first time. Right. And, and when we started playing, people got in li the line lined up at the exits and were yelling insults and were getting out of the fast <laughs> as they could. And yeah. I thought, I I looked behind us. I thought there was a fire or something. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and and but and I thought, okay, we blew it. You know, Zappa <laughs> was out, and at least Zappa was smiling when he walked out. But yeah. Joe, Shep uh, hung in there, and I thought, oh, we blew it. You know, and. And uh, Shep was like, uh, you know, Frankenstein looking at his monster. Oh, the power <laughs> to clear a room like that. We got to yeah. harness that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. He talked a lot about that. I mean, I, and again, I was I was not there then, but I soon got there right after, you know, they you guys had us do schools out. And, and then I don't know whether you knew this, but the, I had prepared a comp in New York that we came out to California with and Tony had showed to Shep. And the, it was the school desk, and I had had it so that the, the legs popped out underneath the album right. so it would stand up like a real album. Well, when I left Craig, uh, Tony and I left together and started Pacific Ioneer, you got They were just finishing up the album cover, and Tom Wilkes, who had partnered with Craig Braun, now it's Wilkes Braun, to finish this album because I couldn't take it with me because I was working for him. Uh, the comp was lost somewhere in the us leaving and them trying to do it. And Tom Wilkes or Craig couldn't figure out how I had created the thing with the latches so that it would lock and stand up. Yeah. So, and so Shep called us and he was kind of freaking out going, Hey man, you know, they, they, they can't figure this out, you know, and I know that, you know, you guys, um, you know, have left Craig and, you know, could you work with us? And I don't know whether you ever heard this, but I, he's asked no. if, can you work with us to help finish this album cover? Because Tom Wilkes or Craig Braun, nobody could figure out how you did it. And so, and he said, you tell me, you show me, and I'll tell them. So they don't have to even know you're involved. You know, because we were really uptight about that because, you know, you can get you can get lawsuits. And that's all we needed from, you know, starting a brand new cover, or I mean, a brand new album each putting in $2,500 to start Pacific Pioneer. Uh, the last thing we needed was a lawsuit from Greg Braun. So he told us, you know, just work with me. And so I put together another comp and we gave it to him. And that's how they finished it. The irony is it's so, it's so perfect because you can perforate those things, which is another tribute to Warner Brothers for a lot of yeah. oh, that yes. extra expense. And inside, you could per, it's perforated so you can cut the pictures out so they're like right. baseball cards kind of a thing yeah. yeah but but uh so it's so perfect because it would stand up 
you know, even though the the irony is that if you're a collectible and now you have one that you punched out all the pictures, it's not worth as much. <laughs> no, but that's okay. What they did, what they do, and you know this, they buy two or three and they yeah, punch yeah, out one yeah. and they have then they have one that's still shrink wrap. I mean, I have a box set that we did together. I have every album that we've done together and for Alice afterwards, all still shrunk wrap. We would buy boxes from the record company with 12 or whatever it was in it. And yeah. we would, you know, of every album we did, you know, so I still have those, man. And along with all the artwork and someday uh, we'll have a show and you'll be able to come and see all that artwork. Or if you're ever out in the desert, let me know, man. And we'll get together. I'll do, I've got, I'll do that. You I know, have all the original art. You know, the desk always reminds me in sixth grade, Washington uh, grade school in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, we had this pretty uh, crazy teacher. He was everybody loved him, but like he would say, uh, if you if you if you have fun in Mr. Neal's class, don't tell your parents how much fun you have. Or yeah, right. Fun will end. <laughs> and anyway, anyway, so there was a kid in class named Todd, and he had his desk was such a mess. It was full of all kinds of crap, just like the album cover. It's got the yeah. screenshots and the marbles <laughs> and, and everything. And and so uh, Mr. Neal would, would crack down on him, you know, clean up your desk. And then it'd be like a blink of an eye and it'd be all crapped up again. So, so Mr. Neal made Todd have two desks. One had to be perfectly neat with his books all organized, and the other one was his crap desk. And, <laughs> and he That's was a cool teacher. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> well, he was a creative guy because they say the creative people tend to be the messiest people. Oh, I know I am. I'm I, I'm pretty creative. And my, I'm, I'm always got a pile of stuff everywhere. You know? But, you know, if somebody straightens out my pile of stuff, I can't find anything. Yeah, exactly. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Exactly. Ernie, I wanted to ask you, now, I heard that there were panties involved in this yeah. album. And I went searching through mine because, you know, I was like uh, pulling out the cover. Where are the panties? Ah, there they are. Thank yeah. you, Dennis. Yeah. Yeah. They're in this shot here, too, on the desk. Were uh, they flammable? They, there was something about them being flammable. Yeah. Well, what had happened was when we, Tony and I went over, we were still with Craig. We went over to meet with Chef. This is after the Palladium show. Uh, when everybody was freaking out and thought that Al, you guys had messed up and Alice hung himself. Uh, and because the lights went out and there was no encore. And and when the lights came back on, everybody was freaking out. And and Shep was brilliant in, in promoting it. If you have a weak heart, don't come to this concert. We have nurses and doctors on staff. You know, and I, and I mean, it was crazy. Everybody thought. And so the only way you could get any kind of information is go back to your house and put on the radio station and listen to what the disc jockey said. And these guys had the disc jockeys tied in going, oh, yeah, you know, there was a, there was an accident and, you know, we're not sure. And so when we had that meeting on Monday morning with Shep, we weren't sure whether we should go or not, because we thought, you know, Alice had hung himself or at least in the hospital or whatever, because there was no Internet. You couldn't figure anything out. It was only disc jockeys. And, 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 you, and that was really one of the brilliance of, that, of Shep. But we showed Shep the comp, and I had put the um, record in a regular Warner Brothers, Brothers sleeve. He pulled the record out and said, no, no, this isn't what it should be. And he had the pair of panties, and it was a pair of paper panties that he had ordered, and they were they were going to drop them over the Hollywood Bowl, right, Dennis? At the, isn't that uh, what it yeah. was? Yeah, we dropped them over the Hollywood Bowl show. Yeah, and then it were but they were tied up before that. They were tied up at the docks because there was a flammable problem with them, right? You can't back. Uh, well, I don't know, if probably still, but there was a law that you can't have paper garments unless they're flame proof or flame right. hardened. Right. So, so the shipment was refused and had to go back to Italy or wherever it was that they were made to be uh, treated. Yes, exactly. But Shep knew again the P.T. Barnum. You know, Gordon was able to just work that like crazy, man. And I mean, there I mean, I get offered all kinds of money for the ones that I have that are still shrink wrapped. I mean, people know, you know, because we've talked about it on the on the Internet, Facebook. And, and I mean, you, you know, the stuff that you guys did was so unique and so different. And I get asked a lot, you know, out of all the album covers that you've done, 
which ones were your favorite? And it's always hands down, Alice Cooper Group. And the Alice Cooper Group, the original group, yes. you know, it kind of changed after Welcome My Nightmare, you know, and it was kind of different. But I think the power of the Alice Cooper Group was something that was unmatchable. And the, the music was incredible. And it was the, I think, the camaraderie that you guys had for, and the respect you had for each other. You know, and I know it worked like that for me at Pacific Pioneer. Tony and I, even though we weren't good friends in New York when we were working with Craig, when we came out to L.A. together to open up the satellite office, we bonded. We bonded the same way you, you guys did. You know, when you go down to, uh, to Hollywood Boulevard and live off the happy hour snacks because you were trying to make it following your dream, you never gave up. And to this day, you're all still amazing. You, you guys blow me away. Well, th thanks, Ernie. I'm going to get a big head here. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, it's true. It's like, OK, so your family, uh, a band is like a marriage. You live yeah. together. We yeah. we were always in the same station wagon, the same hotel rooms. And in the early days, the whole band would be in two rooms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I believe yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, and and there were always things that, you know, you wanted to, it's like, uh, reminds me of the sunshine boys where uh, yeah. Jack Lemon touches Walter Matthau. Walter Matthau. Finger, yeah. the with, finger. The finger. with the finger. With the finger. Don't stop knife. with the finger. <laughs> so there's always stuff like that. But the thing that's, that was what you're talking about uh, for you. And, uh, and there's this artistic uh, thing that we were all driven to the same goal yes and, and that that was where the bond lie so yes. you were willing to overlook a lot of other things you know the finger and stuff like sure, that. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you'd bite your tongue many times i mean and that's that's true and like you said whether it's a band or a marriage it's the same thing you know you guys are really you don't really get to know each other until you're flushing each other's toilet and that's really you know the the, the beautiful thing about you guys were amazing and that you're still friends and you know yeah. we all miss gb i mean when you guys would come to town and stuff he, he, i don't know whether you know this but he would always come over and hang out with us we'd go to hollywood park because he loved the horse races we'd go to movies together every time you guys were in town it was just great and i i miss him a lot you know i know you guys do too it was you know Life yeah. is funny like uh, that. He was a one of a kind character. He didn't yeah. like, he didn't like any kind of rules. Yes. He, he didn't like authority. If anybody yeah. told him what to do, he you were his enemy immediately. And uh so I didn't smoke. He Glenn's the only one that smoked cigarettes in the band. Right. And and I put up with it, but at breakfast. I, I once made the mistake of saying, uh, please don't smoke it for breakfast. So from then <laughs> oh, on, no. every from then on, every time we would have breakfast together, He'd be uh, uh, he would order one egg sunny side up. And when it came, he would stick a cigarette in the middle of the yolk <laughs> with all the ashes and push it to the middle of the table. So I had to look at it while I was eating. <laughs> That's great. That's great. You know, having those kind of memories are just amazing. You know, I mean, I, I have similar ones, too. And with Tony, we were partners for 14 and a half years. And, you know, it was really great. It was really great when you have that kind of camaraderie. And, but, you know, life goes on and things change. And, you know, you guys now are very successful with Blue Coop. And tell us just a little bit about that and where you're going. I know it's two brothers well, from Blue Oyster Cult, right? Right. Uh, Joe and Albert. Uh, Joe was the bass player for Blue Oyster Cult, but he plays guitar with Blue Coop. Mm -hmm. and actually, Joe and Albert were both music teachers and they're both multi-instrumentalists. They both play oh. keyboards and all kinds of stuff cowbell <laughs> no, no, more cowbell. Uh, yeah yeah <laughs> so so we met them in 1972 uh, at an outdoor concert in charlotte north carolina and at that point we had just become headliners and we needed an opening act and we we the band alice cooper group were walking around out in the audience and it's a beautiful day and these guys come on stage with this big backdrop with this symbol on it and yeah. <laughs> start playing. And, and I'm like, let's get those guys, you know? So, <laughs> so we became friends all the way back then. Wow. And uh, uh, Joe and Albert are both very prolific. Uh, they, 
every time uh, you ask them what they're up to, you get you have to sit down because you get tired just listening to all of the stuff that they're doing. Uh, but uh, we have a, a lot of fun together. And uh, this will be our fourth album uh, for Blue Coop. Uh, but it's actually a DVD. It started out uh, just a, a DVD with uh, nine uh, videos on it. And then uh, I decided, well, let's throw in for record store day, let's throw in a bonus CD of outtakes and various things. Sure. And and then we started digging through our archives and finding all of these songs that we didn't we had forgotten about. Basically, you know, we would work them up at a rehearsal and record them. And then we'd decide that that wasn't right for the album and then it would get shelved. And so uh, as we started collecting all of these songs, the cream of the crop. Uh, all of a sudden, wait a minute, this sounds like a real album. <laughs> and, oh. and one, of, one of the songs, especially after mastering and everything, it, it really came to light. But uh, one of the songs, uh, Robbie Krieger had worked with Albert Bouchard on the Imaginos album back in the 80s. And uh, he wrote a song and Joe Bouchard found the song and we had worked it up and recorded it. And then we had even forgotten about it. But Joe found it again, and we sent it. We sent it out to Robbie, and he sent it back to us and said, "I do not remember writing this song, but here it is with a guitar track." So wow, nice. Robbie, That's nice. So Robbie's uh, song that was long lost, fell by the wayside long ago, is all on this album, and also Robbie plays on another track as well, and he's played on some of the other Blue Coop stuff. You know, the Alice Cooper group were friends with the Doors back in the L.A. days. Right. Yeah. Uh, they'd come over. The famous time is when they came over to our house for Halloween and we had a seance. And <laughs> Really? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Paul Rothschild was there and uh, Arthur Lee and David Crosby and the Doors. And, nice. uh, and it was quite quite a memorable evening. Uh, so, so all of these years later, we're still friends with Robbie and, uh, and, and it's great that, you know, no matter what he plays, you immediately know it's him. Yeah. Yeah. He's just awesome. He is so awesome. Dennis, you have a book too, that you wrote. Yeah. Snakes, guillotines, electric chairs, my adventures in the Alice Cooper group. <laughs> 2015. Right. And it's still going strong. It's in yeah. a fourth printing it's been translated into german i did uh i narrated an audio book for it and uh which is on available on audible.com so i know people in my credentials now i also have author yeah, yeah, you know what I, I signed a few of those i think about 50 good. of them paul paul and his wife came over to the house Oh, right. good, and good. and he said you know have them down in the car this was years ago and he said would you mind signing some and yeah, I did. It was great. You know, anything I could do to help you guys, you know, I mean, I still feel like I'm part of the Alice Cooper family, you, are. you know, and it, it's so great. You know, it's great knowing that and feeling that and having, you know, be able to talk with you. Now, this is a couple of times and then sometimes it weren't recorded, which was great, too. It's, it's always good to, you know, reconnect, you know, and uh, and and. We did. A, I'm. I did. A, we did an album for with with for the Doors mainly after you know Jim Morrison had passed away, and we worked with Ray Manzarek, and he was great. And years later, I bumped into him at an airport in Memphis, and he was waiting. I was waiting, and we started talking. He remembered me right away, which was really amazing. And Ray was a really great guy, and Robbie, you know. Yeah. And I never met Jim Morrison, but I really was a big fan of the Doors. Oh yeah, they were amazing. They were the soundtrack for LA back at when, yeah. Yeah. when we were all going strong there. Yeah, all coming up. No, I was going to say the other thing about the Schools Out album is the photograph that's in of the band that's inside the cover. Uh, we did that photo shoot, and there's and we had a lot of takes, but. Uh, so many fans, it took them decades to figure out where I was in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> because I kind of disappeared. I'm, I'm inside of a garbage can with a hat and my face is shaded, but I'm aiming yeah. a pis pistol right at the camera. Right. And I have my shoes sitting in front of the garbage can. 
And, and that was a great photo shoot. I mean, you know, that, those out, those pictures are really still in, in high demand from all your fans and collectors, hardcore collectors. Well, yeah, in the time know. remaining, you know, we do, Dennis, Ernie and I have what's called a mind meld, and we look at each LP and we pick a favorite. And Ernie, since Dennis is our guest. I agree. Which one do you, would you like me to play, Dennis? On one or two, Dennis, your top two yes. favorites from oh, School's Out. Oh, songs from school. Yeah. Yes, yeah. You, yeah the oh floor is yours, my friend. It's so obvious, but it's hard not to say school's out. <laughs> but, uh, but I wrote Looney Tune and uh, and and also the other one that's quite unusual, but it really uh, shines for Glenn Buxton's guitar playing versatility is uh, Blue Turk. Yes. Blue Turk is the jazzy beatnik kind of a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both both those are great. Looney Tunes and that are great picks, Dennis. And, and thank you so much, man. Thank you for doing this, and we'll be in touch for sure. And maybe maybe you'll be willing to come back and talk about one of the other five albums that we had done together, including the you box. My, you got my number. I know. Dennis, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And by the way, you have an upcoming birthday. I but I was looking, and I think you are a December baby. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, happy December. birthday. Happy, Happy Yeah, a day after Jim Morrison, but uh, but unfortunately in America, the dates fall different in England and America. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then there was Pearl Harbor, John Lennon's death, and then my birthday. And I'm thinking things happen in threes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, all, all good things, all good things, man. You know, thank God you're here to appreciate that year. And last year and the new year, new year is going to hold really great for you and all of us. And thank you so much, Dennis. Yeah, it really was great meeting you, Joyce uh, and Ernie. Always great. And uh, have a great holiday. <laughs>